Welcome to the Art of Strength and Mind podcast with your host, Brandon Duff and Eugene Trufkin. This is a podcast about healthy living. Perfect. Welcome to the podcast. And what is one interesting fact about yourself? I have lived in six different states and I moved a total of a dozen times through my childhood. So I've encountered every type of different person and lived in every type of different climate in the U.S. Interesting. What different states? I started in Arizona. Then we went to Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, back to Georgia, and then to Detroit, Michigan. And then on my own, I came out here. Wow. That's quite a bit of travel. Yeah. And within all those states, we moved multiple times too. That's crazy. So people know you for the two-minute diet. What else should people know about you? Where are you from? Tell us a little bit more about you. A lot of people actually primarily know me as the founder of HPN, High Performance Nutrition. That's where I really kind of found my groove as an entrepreneur. I founded that company in 2010 after starting in retail. I owned part of a sports nutrition store and I was the operator of the store and I saw a market opportunity for a company that would specialize in producing top level products. I'm talking like the Ferrari of sports nutrition with patented ingredients that also brought in the testing that professional athletes would require. So testing every single batch of every product to where it could be guaranteed that not only did it meet label claims, but that it wouldn't contain any of the hundreds of possible banned substance contaminants that an athlete could be suspended for or have their reputation ruined for. So that's how HPN started. And that took me from 2010 to now. And there's a special kind of certificate you need to have that, right? That, that claim that you can be used for athletes in the athletic or in the college and the professional level, correct? Right. So the, the primary one that a lot of professional athletic teams will look for is the NSF for sport certification. But the other big one, the one that I actually prefer, the one I think is the best certification in the world, is the Banned Substance Control Group quality control testing program. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Gotcha. So, uh, Sean, for like the average person basically shopping for supplements and say like at Sprouts or Whole Foods or maybe getting it on Amazon or like bodybuilding.com, for them, like one supplement, kind of the next supplement, this whey protein, that whey protein, it's kind of might be all the same from their eyes and perspectives. Can you like give like a general overview of the steps and processes required from taking kind of like a raw ingredient, from finding like a raw ingredient supplier, like a credible one? To like a completely finished product. Can you kind of like outline that step-by-step process? It's actually a pretty involved process. And it's something I think people should know because people are buying these products and they're not a t-shirt. We're not just putting it on our body or, you know, putting it on a desk in our house. It's not a computer or a phone. We actually ingest this stuff. So I think knowing kind of the steps that may or may not even be implemented with the products you consume is pretty crucial for people. So For us, the process that we abide by is called the GMP. That's a good manufacturing practice. And that's a protocol that up until about five years ago wasn't even legally required for dietary supplements. Uh, Back in the 90s, due to a senator named Orrin Hatch in, in Utah, supplements were put into their own category, aside and apart from food and drugs. So they're regulated by something called DSHEA. It's a it's an act that puts them in their own little space where The regulations for bringing it to market are loose as long as it contains ingredients that are approved. And to be an approved ingredient, either you were on that list of things that was previously sold when that act was put into place in the 90s, or you have to go through a very intensive process that's not too much easier than launching a new drug in terms of proving the safety to have any new ingredient. And I know about that process because we actually launched an ingredient called nicotinamide riboside that required that. It was new to market in 2015, didn't exist before that. Actually, 2013, when we first launched it, we had to acquire this thing from the FDA. It's called an NDI, a new dietary ingredient. So in the starting place, when you're making a product, you have to use ingredients, and there are thousands that are part of this act that you're legally allowed to use. If you don't, it's actually something where companies get in trouble later because the ingredient that they brought forward, especially some of the stimulants or some of these pro-hormone type of ingredients, they were never approved. 
for human usage as a dietary supplement. They're not part of that act. So they're actually a misbranded drug. Oh, wow. And companies will bring these things forward. But let's say you want to make a protein powder. And in my case, I, I, I don't believe too much in whey protein. Not that I don't believe it works. It does, but I prefer plant-based protein. So let's say you were going to make a plant-based protein powder. You would need to identify a supplier for each ingredient. And you would need to make sure those suppliers follow the GMP practices because they have their own supply chain of how they produce that raw ingredient. And you need to make sure that they do everything correctly on their end because they're going to be one of however many components in your product. Quick question. So these suppliers that you get, can you just get them from China? And are they doing the same kind of regulations that we are doing here or that surf certificate that you talked about is that lo like nationally is that locally in the orange county here or is that all over the world how does that how does that work depending on the ingredient it could come from the us it may come from china it could come from brazil it could come from india it really just depends on where that ingredient is produced okay. and yes there are quality control references in every country so having an ingredient come from china or wherever is not necessarily to imply that it's of a lower grade. Okay. Some things just simply aren't made here. Interesting. Um, so for example, we used a black rice extract in the past that was grown in Malaysia. We currently use a long jack herb that's grown in Malaysia. That's not any detriment to the quality of the product. That's just where that herb grows. Definitely. And then to support that local economy where that herb is grown and probably to maximize efficiency, the company who holds the rights to that ingredient who produces it, they also complete the manufacturing process there because it would make sense to not transport it, manufacture it, and then transport it again. So if you can do your manufacturing close to on site where the ingredient is developed and certainly within the country, it makes the process a lot faster. But they can definitely uh, uh, adhere to the same GMPs because they're worldwide and there are agencies worldwide. Here, the NSF is the biggest one. But in other countries, it may be a different agency, but they adhere to the same standards. That's great. What are some of those GMP standards, like uh, checks and balances that they have in place to assure that quality assurance? It's all about a paper trail. That's one of the biggest things is having records of how everything came to be. So in the case of a finished product, you would need to have the paper trail of where each of your components came from your paper trail for testing the blend after you manufactured. And if you want to be top level quality, a independent record of testing that was done on top of the testing that you do in house. Now, in house testing is required when you make products. So back to the production of a, of a new product, you've gathered all your ingredients, you've maintained the records of where you got them all from, and all those suppliers were GMP certified. Then you're going to take them to a, a facility or your own facility to blend them according to those same standards. So now for every type of machine that you may use, there's a protocol for how it should be used in terms of the cleaning that should be done to it beforehand, the preparation, the testing. And then when you start the manufacturing process, there's record keeping required, like within the few minutes of when you start blending to make sure quality is consistent. And then when you're done, there's, there's record keeping for every wow. step of the way, if you're adhering to these protocols. And basically, it's all about ensuring a standard level of quality to where you know exactly what's going in your capsules or in your bottles if it's a powder. So with that product that we've made from scratch, we've got the ingredients, we've blended them, we've tested that blend. If we were really being on point, as you know, I try to be with our operations, you would even test some or all lots of the uh, raw ingredients as you get them. You may have testing from that manufacturer where you got it, but you would probably additionally want to test it yourself at least sometimes to make sure that you're keeping them honest hmm. because they might tell you that it had no bacterial contamination, no heavy metals. The raw ingredient suppliers are not typically testing for banned substances. It's not really relevant to them, but they should be proving that it you know, meets the claims that it's supposed to with what's called a certificate of analysis. They should provide that for every production that they do. That where they've tested their own ingredients somewhere else to prove that it was legitimate. That's great. You, they should give you that. But sometimes, and I would say for us, almost every time, especially if it's a new ingredient, we're going to test it on top of that when we get it. Because we don't want to get into a situation where we took their word on it, completed an entire production, and then failed testing. That could be a 
multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars catastrophe. And time. Yeah, time. And you may be out of stock. Consumers may not trust your brand anymore. You want to avoid all that. So usually we do extra testing. That's great. So first with the GMP certification, like when a person buys a supplement, is this kind of like a stamp they're going to see on the on the bottle or do they have to go to the company's website and see it under their like quality assurance tab? How do I know like the supplement I'm buying is GMP certified, it's made in a GMP lab uh, or et cetera. Now, typically, if you're doing these things, you're you're pretty proud of it. You wouldn't really do this in secret and be okay. like, uh, I'm not going to tell anyone about how good our products are. It's something that you would want to market. At least maybe it's not the centerpiece of your marketing. I realize it's actually not a good marketing centerpiece. We've I've tried that in the mm-hmm. past. But you you want it to be there underlying, but very easy to discover. And usually this is best accomplished by having a stamp on your label. And you pay big money to do that, to have these agencies allow you to place that stamp on the label. So if you've done everything that would be required, you would pretty proudly display it. You know, it's like if you're if you have a PhD or or you're a medical doctor, you usually would like to have it say MD after your name or whatever. You know, like for for us as trainers, the CSCS, whatever you got, you you kind of want it to be known. Exactly. You would show that if you had it, usually on your label. Now, because a company doesn't have it, it's not a guarantee that they don't. You could go to their website and investigate it. But I would say probably nine out of 10 times, if it's not on the label, they're not doing it. Does the government oversee that? Or is that like a private company that oversees that quality assurance? Or The NSF is a private agency. They're a billion dollar company. You may have seen their sign. It's a blue circle and it says NSF in all caps. That's a National Safety or Sanitation Foundation. They do a lot of work with restaurants, way more than supplements. They're a billion dollar agency. The supplement part of what they do is probably less than 5% of their business. It's very small to them, but they happen to be world-class at it. Now, they are very, very optimal for regulating like facilities of production. But as I was saying, for testing individual batches and guaranteeing the legitimacy of that finished product when it's completely done and you want to have it tested out of house, I actually think that the world-class testing, the best in the world, is the banned substance control group. And that was founded by a man named Don Catlin, who you may or may not know as being the, the guy who, the scientist who caught Lance Armstrong. He's a very highly world-renowned. He pretty much wrote the book for WADA and for the Olympic Committee about how to catch people who were cheating drug tests and how to even develop tests for drugs. Right. right? And it is a constant cat and mouse games with that, with athletics because guys are finding ways to beat tests. But as far as a guy who's pioneered testing, both in terms of testing athletes and testing products, it's Don Catlin. With supplements, would you say that I should just take supplements, not eat food and get all my nutrients through supplements? Is that like take protein shakes and I'll be good? I'll be like a bodybuilder? Yeah. I mean, and I don't think at this point, many bodybuilders are doing that either. I think anyone who is actually, you know, caring about the outcome of what's going on is going to tell you that supplements are just that they add on to a well-managed nutritional approach and some type of a, a training regimen, you know, very goal specific to the individual. Having them in isolation of those two things, having just trying to build your protocol on supplementation will not work. It has to be on top of the nutritional and activity component being managed. I like to use a little analogy that I, our bodies are like a luxury car or a rocket ship. And we need to put rocket fuel into our bodies because if we're putting 87 into like a BMW or a luxury car or into a rocket, it's not going to go. And I think of supplements is that gas alternative that you add, it's not going to run your car, but it makes you, your car, your rocket perform that much better. And I have to agree with you. And for me, a lot of times, especially when think with things that are more basic in nature, like let's just say vitamins and minerals, people will often hit me with, okay, I don't need to take any kind of a supplement to support that. I eat a very healthy diet and I have, you know, something that is really difficult to answer back to, to that, which is that even if you eat a well-balanced diet, if you try and get a bunch of different sources of fruits and vegetables incorporated into your diet, you try and eat organic, whole food, unprocessed things, avoid pesticides, drink the best water. There's another issue, and that's the I- issue of absorption. And what I'm saying by that is that different types of vitamins and minerals are absorbed 
more or less effectively depending on how you prepare your food as well. Yeah. So if you have water soluble versus fat soluble vitamins or minerals or antioxidants that you're trying to absorb or different zoo nutrients from your animal products or phytonutrients from plant sources, how you prepare them is all going to impact what you absorb too. So if you have a fat soluble vitamin and you you know steam it and just eat it by itself, you're not going to get the most out of that food source. If you have a water-soluble vitamin and you steam it, it's gone. You're going to lose most of it. Same thing goes with a lot of different phytonutrients and et cetera. Minerals, if you don't steam it, you're not going to get it because it's still going to be bound to the oxalates within the plant and you won't optimally absorb that iron or calcium. So it's like, well, how do I cook my food to make sure that I get everything out of it? And all these things have to be considered. So it's like I tell people, do your best, eat a healthy diet, understand what you're putting in your body and the ramifications that has. But take things like supplements, not just to optimize performance, but to also give yourself an insurance policy. Bridge the gap between anything you may not have absorbed properly that day. Yeah. And can you also kind of go over kind of how important, if it is even important to see kind of like that the supplement is sourced from like organic sources versus not non-organic versus like a factory farm, for instance, and kind of like where processing methods kind of like play into that, you know, more so than like whether it's organic or not organic. Yeah, as far as the raw ingredient being organic, typically it's not going to have too much impact on the final product because if you're extracting one particular component out of that product, now unless if it's been proven, let's just say like with organic beef or grass-fed beef, there's more CLA content in it. And so you're going to eat that beef. I think it's very important that those things be considered if you're going to actually eat the thing directly that has been grown or cultivated in a certain manner. But when it comes to supplements, there's usually multiple steps of purification where we're trying to get down to an exact outcome and everything else is removed. So when people drink like uh, grass-fed whey protein, and if it costs significantly more, I'm not sure that's necessarily the best use of their budget because there's not really going to be significantly higher levels of anything in that grass-fed protein. It may make you feel better and that might in itself substantiate the price increase, but there's not going to be any higher levels of IGF or any other immunoglobulins that that are in whey protein because it was grass fed, because we've already filtered all that out. The reason I ask is because like some companies like I see sold at, you know, like high end organic grocery stores, and then you can kind of check out the label claims on like cleanlabelproject.org. And they're like organic and non-GMO and this certified and this certified. But then you see like their report on there and they're like, oh, found like a lot of like trace amounts of heavy metals or like this chemical and that chemical. And I'm like, man, what are all these like crazy labels and everything? And it shows like the reports like a one out of five stars, you know? And that speaks to me about the importance of the manufacturing process being just as important as the ingredients themselves. If you start with great ingredients, you can still, like, let's say if you're cooking a dish, you can still burn the food. Yeah. And so that's, you can have the best ingredients in the world, but if you have a terrible chef and he burns the food, you're going to still end up with bad food. That's a good analogy. So we, you, you have to manage the production process. Having these GMPs is very important because at any step, something can go wrong. A little bit of moisture can get into it. A little bit of heavy metal can get into it through exposure to the the product that was blended before yours, right? So when you're having these machines do blending, which you need to do, you can't really do it by hand. It has to be done with the machine. They need to be cleaned down to a certain spec where you're talking about nanogram levels of existence of whatever was previously manufactured on it. And if that's not done correctly, or if it's done at any kind of inappropriate manner, whatever was made previously can get into your product. It could be at a trace level and it could be at a significant level, but that matters just as much as what ingredients went into it. So a lot of companies have really focused because it works with food. They've focused on the origins of their ingredients, but neglected the manufacturing process. You got to do both. How many companies actually abid by these either CGMP or GMP standards? In the industry. What's funny is it should be 100% because it's now legally required. It wasn't before, but now it is required that you maintain it. It's just really at this point a matter of the fact that the FDA has other things to do besides cracking down on, on supplement companies. They really don't care that much. That's why they put it in its own little category and said, you guys just do what you want to do. As long as no one dies, <laughs> we'll leave you alone. If people start calling us and complaining, we're coming. 
So they're not actively searching for people to take down, which they should be, uh, but they, they're they not because they're too busy, you know, preventing E. coli outbreaks at Chipotle. Yeah. They, they have bigger things that they're trying to fry uh, in, in lieu of, did you get enough protein in your scoop or, you know, was there a little bit of arsenic in, in your vitamin? These are things that are not good. They should never happen, but they just don't have time to crack down on it. And so it will take hundreds of consumer complaints or a couple of deaths usually, which isn't going to happen from your protein being shorted or a little bit of lead in your in your stuff. It's not going to happen. So the likelihood of companies getting caught isn't very high. So circling back around, less than 10% of companies are doing it right or are, are adhering to all of these guidelines. How does the inspection process work? Do they randomly show up like once a year or is it scheduled inspection or maybe once every other year? How does it they're coming to you at least once for a full audit each year. Okay. That's where they're going to go through everything top to bottom. But that's not just to say, what does the site look like on this day that we come? That's also, let's inspect all your records for the last year. That's once. Now, they're also additionally going to come quarterly just for a brief site inspection. That's not for the full audit. That's for a brief site inspection. And they're not announcing those. They might tell you the day of that they're coming or the day before, but that's not really enough time for you to fix anything that's truly wrong. So they're going to come for that. Then on top of that, you're submitting all the products when they're completed for independent testing on their end. So it's like it's pretty comprehensive in terms of making sure you're operating correctly on an ongoing basis, auditing your records, and then testing your product. So you have this amazing record or product that everyone should be taking should it cure me of diseases? Should it cure, like what, what are supplements do? What are they helpful for? And that's an important question because the big thing that I hear often to try and like kind of bring us down from people who don't believe in supplements for any number of reasons, maybe they had a bad experience or whatever, is that, oh, supplements aren't even approved by the FDA. And that's a true statement, yeah. but it's one that's misguided because they're not supposed to be approved by the FDA. So if it was approved by the FDA, that would make it a drug. It wouldn't be a supplement anymore. And people have to understand it is so important that supplements be allowed to exist. And that's not necessarily just a bias statement because I, I live in that space, but because people need to understand that bringing something to market as a supplement is allowing innovation to occur. It's pushing people like me to develop new products that are on the cutting edge of helping us as individuals manage our own health and not have to rely on a broken medical system and information from from the government or wherever that is not helping us live better. It's pushing innovation to find new things in nature that can help us starting today and for the next, you know, 100 years of our lives hopefully live and feel better. So supplements are not intended to treat or cure a disease. Mm -hmm. If that was the intention of the supplement, if you want to go that route, a natural ingredient can become a drug. Fish oil has done it with certain brands. If you want to do that, you just need to undergo the, the process of, of drug approval. Otherwise, you exist in the supplement space where, like I said, you're limited to a gamut of ingredients that have been approved, or you go through the process of, of providing extensive human safety data while well, actually starting in in vitro with cell, then animal and human data. You have to present that and file for what's called GRAS, G-R-A-S generally recognized as safe status. You apply for that, you self-affirm it, and then you have it done independently. You apply to the FDA for an NDI, new dietary ingredient, and then that can legally be sold. So you either bring it to market as a supplement or you go the drug route. But if you're existing as a supplement, you're not making disease claims like uh, we're curing this, that, or the other, or treating it. But no, we're, we're part of a healthy lifestyle management approach that will hopefully help you in a number of different ways. But we try and stay away from making disease claims, even if, and it's crazy, it may be an effective treatment for a disease. It might have that capacity, but if you don't want to become a drug, you have to stay away from it. What are some supplements or vitamins or minerals people can take in the morning to boost their day? So it depends on what type of approach you follow to your day overall. And when I say that, I mean really popular right now, I'm sure you guys know, is an intermittent fasting approach or oftentimes combined with it or run separately would be a ketogenic approach. These two things are often confused as being the same by people who, who haven't researched them yet. And that's why I do two minute diet videos to try and clarify that type of stuff. But ketogenic being a diet that is 
very, very low to zero carbohydrate with a higher fat and, and low uh, protein content to induce the body to produce its ketones by breaking down fatty acid to supply immediate energy because glucose is so low because our blood sugar is so low. If you're following that type of approach in the morning, you're typically not hungry is what a lot of people find. I would say probably like 80, 90% of people who follow that type of approach have very little appetite in the morning because whatever they've eaten the day before is still having them feel pretty full and they haven't exerted themselves yet. So they don't eat. So if you're in that population and you like to run intermittent fasting approach where you don't eat in the morning, one of my favorite things to include in your day would be ketones, like a ketone supplement of some sort to provide exogenous ketones where you're not giving your body any you know, difficult digestion work. And you'll notice that the other couple things I'll recommend here have very little digestive effort required. I'm a big fan of not eating in the morning, right when you wake up. That takes, that's time that, you know, you need to use for preparation to, of the meal or just to eat it. And then it's also causing a number of switches, if you will, to be flipped in our body metabolically, where now we have to break down this food. We have to allocate resources to deal with that food, to digest it, especially if it's whole food. So the things I'm going to recommend, the ketones, possibly MCT oil, depending on your calorie situation. Like if you're trying to lose weight, it may be something that you want to skip. But if you're happy with where your weight is or you're, you know, you're not you're super overweight, including MCT oil in the morning, because again, it's a rapidly available energy source and then coffee. And I say coffee as a supplement because it's kind of made in a similar way uh, to supplements in terms of how it's sourced and produced. And it can either be made less or more effectively in terms of production methods. Those are three things that I think everyone will benefit from in the morning first thing. What's your take on kind of like I hear like a lot of back and forth between this uh, subject, like isolated vitamins or minerals versus like the vitamin or mineral complex that happens in like nature, whether you should be having like an isolated vitamin and let's say like a vitamin C, like 1000 milligrams, which is basically 10 oranges worth of just vitamin C without any of the other associated or, or the fiber that or, yeah, might, yeah, yeah. might impair or improve uh, the speed of digestion and absorption. So probably keep it in your body a little bit longer so you can extract more nutrient out of it. Because when you have the vitamin in isolated form, you're getting a larger dose of exposure to it, but that's not necessarily what you absorb. You know, because oftentimes said you're what you are, what you eat, but it's really more so that you are what you eat and absorb and, sure. and utilize. So I'm a fan of utilizing isolated vitamins if one is uh, deemed to be deficient in them through blood testing or however, you know, symptoms you may use to track that. I like it, but not in absence of a balanced whole food approach. You know, if you're told by your doctor or through your own self-discovery that you need to up your vitamin C level, if you're not doing anything dietarily to influence that, then I don't think you need to take a supplement approach yet. But if you're taking a dietary approach and, and you're cognizant of trying to get more vitamin C incorporated into your diet through whole foods, and that's not doing the trick, that's when I would bring in a dietary supplement. And oftentimes, I think a lot of you know, people will benefit from isolated vitamins and minerals that don't really occur too easily. You're not getting them too easily in your diet. Like some people are, are big fans of taking vitamin K2. It's hard to get that unless you eat natto, which is not a regular part of most people's diet. So supplementing with that for, for bone health might be a, a legitimate you know, reason to get an isolated vitamin or mineral. But when it comes to the basics, I think kind of getting them all in one in some kind of a, a strong, comprehensive vitamin formula. And then as we talked about earlier, doing your best with a, a solid daily diet that's varied and includes fruits and vegetables and healthy food sources is, a, is the right way to do it. It's the right frame of mind. Gotcha. And can you give me also like your opinion on like GMOs being used for like a large variety of vitamins and if it even matters like after the whole entire processing, if it is it does come from a GMO source or non-GMO source? Yeah, I think that that goes back to what we were talking about with when you're at the vitamin and mineral isolated level, it's not going to matter if it came from a GMO source or not. That's the actuality of it. But in terms of another analogy where, you know, personally to me, it matters like the the reason I bring this up, sometimes the source does matter, uh, even though the nutrition facts are going to be the same. And that, that matters with a very popular supplement category, BCAAs, branched chain amino acids. They can either come from discarded animal products like ligaments, tendons, 
feathers, skin, cartilage, or they can be fermented from a plant source. They're both going to be bioidentical at the end of the day. It doesn't really matter, but one of them has a yuck factor, and I don't really like that. So I'd rather I'd rather produce and myself personally use the one that came from the plant source, right? So it doesn't truly matter, but it may or may not matter to you as an individual. So if something is GMO or not in terms of how the plant is grown, it's literally not going to matter in terms of what you consume on the downstream, especially if that ingredient, let's say it was GMO, but it's gone through all the necessary testing. It doesn't have any heavy metals in it. It meets its label claim. It has no bacteria in it. It's passed all that type of testing. There is no difference at that point because you're just talking about one isolated component from within it. Everything else is gone. It's been stripped away. So through purification, so it shouldn't matter. Yeah. Well, regarding uh, plant-based proteins, is there a way to extract all the heavy metals from it? Or is that kind of like an impossible processing? Yeah. Talking about all of anything is not going to really happen. There's going to be some trace amount. I mean, even in the water that we're drinking right now, no matter how pure it is, there's some level, but it's like what's acceptable and what's not is really more so the question. Cause there's some things that are so high, we're advised to consume them in moderation. Like let's just say tuna, you know, you have fish that eat a lot of other fish or things that are high up on the food chain. People talk about eating low on the food chain to minimize heavy metal and contaminant exposure. And that makes sense. But when you have the desire to strip away the heavy metal to zero, to absolute zero, it's unlikely. You can actually get to non-detectable levels through your manufacturing methods, which we we try and do for our plant-based protein. And uh, we're, we're successful at that. But there's still some level of detection that could occur if you were to really dig in deep, but that's just naturally occurring from the plant itself and from the groundwater, the soil, but you can minimize it for sure. Uh, in comparing like, for instance, whey protein isolate with like some plant-based protein powder, which one typically would have like more contaminants? I find that the whey proteins tend to have more contaminants, but I'm not sure if that's a victim of circumstance and that companies who make whey protein are oftentimes less passionate about the products themselves. And that might just be an unrelated factor, you know, so Mm -hmm. it may not be down to the material itself. They may not be as cognizant or considerate of where they buy their ingredients or how they make their products. I feel like a lot of the companies that I've encountered that are really focused on plant-based products, they've come and started from a place of trying to make the body healthier. A lot of times companies that have started with a whey protein, they came from a place of either trying to make money or even like, let's just say a little bit more nobly, trying to increase performance. And sometimes when we're trying to increase performance, we let other variables go in lieu of maxing out that performance benefit. And so they are like, you know, I I know we can probably all relate. We're all guys who work out. At some point it was like, you'd do anything to try and gain five more pounds of muscle or 10 more pounds on a certain lift. So you kind of like would nest, like put in the back, like long-term outcomes for what you can get right now. And so that's the same, that sports nutrition mentality is kind of where a lot of whey protein companies started versus the plant-based. A lot of them are like trying to build better health or do things organically more naturally or whatever. But for that reason, I find less contamination as well as a a plant is as low as it gets on the food chain, right? They're not going to be as exposed to as much as let's say a cow would be that you would then get the milk from it and purify that out of. But Both sources can be equally as pure if the right processing and and purification is done. So we talk a lot about the body. And are supplements really only for the body? Do you think, what if I need more focus? Or what if I just have that head fog? Is there something I can do? Is there things that help me with that kind of performance? I think mental performance and body optimization not relative to physical performance is the coolest category of supplements there is. Because you start doing the gym thing, you, you start training, and you realize that you can, you can really dramatically influence the shape of your body, and that's cool. But if you've ever taken a week off or eaten a, a few bad meals in a row, you realize how fast that can go. Yeah, like definitely. how Water fast- going through your hands. Yeah, how fast your body can, <laughs> can be made to be sculpted to look incredible and how fast it can go down the drain. And if anyone's ever been injured, you've seen how fast muscles atrophy. And that's led me down this path of discovery of like, what can I do to make sure my long-term health is optimal? Like as, as good as it feels to 
squat 405 or deadlift 500 pounds, how good would it feel to like, you know, be in a, a conversation with you guys and feel like I'm accessing all the brain power I have. I'm able to recall things faster. I'm able to engage in meaningful dialogue with you guys for longer yeah, and recall. then continue and have my day be firing on all cylinders from the time when it starts to the time when it ends. How cool would that be? That would be awesome. And it's even cooler. That it, it actually feels better than the equivalent in the gym because the gym is, is a, it's, crucial and i'll say that it's crucial it's something that you know is very important to me as part of my routine but it's one hour of the day or a certain amount of time of the day the other eight hours or, or 10 12 hours that you may spend working or with loved ones that's a lot of time so i want that to be dialed in too so supplements that that make that more effective i think are very important what would someone take what is something like that that to optimize your mind there's a whole class of supplements I'm sure you've heard of called nootropics that are focused on increasing one element or another of cognitive function, usually either communication speed or effectiveness. So like the fluidity of which you can like recall words or, or gather your thoughts. There is retention capacity, how, how much you can remember. And then there's another thing, neuroplasticity. So like how much we can push our brain capacity to expand and evolve. And so there's different supplements that kind of attack one or more of those categories, but they're all natural herbs for the most part. And, and, well, typically you, you'll find that, you know, well-designed products that are in that space contain multiple of them, trying to help attack all the categories in one, trying to make a, a separate product that where we are right now is where kind of pre-workouts were like maybe 10 years ago where there was companies making them, but not a lot doing it correctly. So the people who are super serious about it would get their own individual ingredients and try and mix them up. But the problem is that, man, now you're exposing yourself to a lot of quality control issues because then you're as a consumer trusting every one of those individual ingredient suppliers that they've done everything right. So there's so much chance for something to go wrong when you're trying to make your own stuff at home. So there's a lot of room right now and a lot of innovation occurring really on a, on a monthly basis for new products that are meant to address multiple aspects of that cognitive function. Something that you could take either in the morning when you wake up or let's say after you work out, if you're going to, whenever you want to optimize mental performance the most. So for me, I, I wake up and I train in the morning and then I start my day. Uh, that for me makes me feel incredible. It's like a natural nootropic training. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one of the best things anyone can do is to get a movement session of some sort, whatever you like in the morning, then start your day. And again, like I said, I, I prefer to stay fasted into the morning and uh, up until around lunchtime. And that could be if someone really gets hungry at 10 or 11, I say eat at that time. But what your body will tell you, but I like to get firing on all cylinders before I get a dramatic change in blood sugar going, which would come from eating. So these nootropics would typically be taken at that time when you're going to start your work. If you start work at 8 a.m. and you wake up at 6.30 or something, you would probably take the nootropic at 7. You want to take it about an hour, half an hour at the closest before you're going to start your work because it's not a pre-workout. It's something that will absorb into your bloodstream. It has to be digested and utilized. It's not just caffeine. If your nootropics main ingredient is caffeine, that's what coffee is. You could just drink yeah. coffee. But these other things, I'll tell you a couple of them that I like. One of them is called alpha GPC. That's an ingredient that can really help a lot of people. Alpha GPC. Another one I really enjoy is Siberian ginseng. There's another one that has a little bit of controversy on it because it's gone back and forth between being allowed and not allowed. It's called paracetam. Oh, usually those are the most potent. It, it, sometimes <laughs> they are, yeah. Out. Sometimes, uh, you know, the discovery of what's going on in the field is ahead of what has been approved in terms of regulations. But there is a need for these things to be done correctly. Like, like I said, we've had some experience with a novel ingredient, meaning one that was new to the market, that we had to do all the safety data for. And I'm proud that we did it because even though it's an extremely expensive and time-consuming process, we're really happy to promote that we did it because that, to me, is true innovation. When you have something and you do all the right steps to prove that it's worthy of being a, an ingredient on the market rather than just saying, hey, this works and feels really good. We don't have enough info yet, but just take it if you want. <laughs> How long is that process of getting some... Uh... Yeah, a new ingredient. Again, the FDA doesn't approve products. They'll improve ingredients and facilities. So the FDA, on top of the NSF, by the way, the FDA will also inspect your facility. It's a separate audit from what the NSF does, but the FDA at least comes once a year 
to maintain your approval through them. And that's not an approval on your product saying that this product or that is approved. It's an approval on your facility itself for production. But how long does it take? It will take as little as 12 months or as long as 24 to 36 months. It's really how fast can you gather the data that is necessary. So if you have hundreds of thousands of dollars to throw at it or millions of dollars, you could probably get the research and the safety data that you need pretty quickly. If you don't, you may have to space it out. Oh, so it's one of those things where you do your own research, then send the research to the FDA inspector. They look over your research. And if it's kind of like a well-controlled study, then they'll be like, okay. Yeah. And it won't be one. One study will never get it done. It'll be multiple studies starting at the cellular level, moving to animal and then into human data and multiple different applications. And then you have to have all of the pharmacology and, and pharmacokinetics of how your product works, how that in, the ingredient, I should say, should stay away from calling it product. So how the ingredient works in the body, you have to have all that mapped out and understood. And if they agree with your explanation, they agree with your data, and they believe that it's also safe, then they'll issue that NDI. What would be the top five ingredients you could give our listeners to optimize their life? So I would say for me, recommending to everyone if if you care about mental performance yeah, yeah. as well as physical performance oh, yeah I'll... yeah so if you if we're trying to blend the two i'm not going to count a protein powder at all because i count that as food it's a supplement yes it's made as a supplement but it's replacing or being consumed in lieu of a food source so i don't count that guy okay so we won't count him ketones are big for me for being a fuel source that is preferential in the brain so if you want to have optimal brain function, consuming ketones gives you the ability to benefit from them without having to be in a chronic state of ketosis. So being in chronic ketosis may not be the best thing for us, right? Unless if we're in a diseased state where using ketosis can treat like certain types of cancers or epilepsy. But if you're in a healthy population, chronic deep ketosis may not be the best thing. So having a ketone supplement can allow you to benefit from that, from the basically supercharging effect it can have on brain function without having to severely, severely restrict and deplete carbohydrates. That's one. A second one that I'm a big, big proponent of, no matter what your goal set would be, is creatine. Creatine monohydrate, especially in the patented form, CreaPure, it comes from Germany. So again, we're speaking about how high quality things can come from anywhere in the world. The company who owns it is called Allschem. We've been in, in contact and in cooperation with them for as long as HPN has, has existed, but they are an ingredient supplier of their own and they sell, you know, to thousands of companies around the world, but it's called Crea Pure. That's the only type of creatine I would recommend because they've done not one, not two, not three, but dozens of human safety studies with their exact ingredients. So that's a situation where I would say creatine is not creatine. They're not all the same. These are the guys who've done all the research. They put all the time into not only substantiating how it works and why it works, but also that their particular manufacturing method is unique, different, and the best. They have patents around the world that are very strictly enforced for that purpose. So why is this a, on my top five list though? Because there, there won't be any other supplements that are strictly for getting stronger on there or bigger is because it can also benefit bone health and brain health. Creatine is such a versatile supplement. It got really pigeonholed into being something that's just used by bodybuilders, but really it should be in everyone's regimen as a daily nutrient because it can also extremely profoundly affect the way and level that your brain can function at and your bone density maintenance over time. Very cool stuff. Yeah, very cool. The third one that I think would be positive for everyone to incorporate, almost mandatory for me, possible. Now, not everyone would be able to, depending on your lifestyle, would be a fish oil. If you don't, if you are vegan or for any reason allergic or opposed to a fish source, there are really cool up and coming plant sources of omega-3 and 6, 9 supplementation, but particularly three. We have a, a very high ratio of six in our diet already. We yeah, want to improve that. I think an omega-3 supplement usually being sourced from a fish oil is the most potent currently would be a very smart one for most people to incorporate. Great. Yeah, I had a quick question about the like omega supplements. I know there's like a little bit of controversy about them these days saying kind of like they increase your chance of getting cancer or most of them are like rancid. I actually take an omega-3 as well, but I just wanted wanted your opinion on that. I think they're a great supplement, but 
the research is completely dictating that is one of the best supplements you could take, the entirety of it. I'm sure that there are, are studies that could be pinpointed to try and tell a certain narrative or another, but we understand that we need to have a higher ratio of omega-3 content that it can dramatically improve brain function and outcomes in terms of reducing heart disease and certain types of cancer. So having it incorporated in our daily diet is a no-brainer, but obtaining it strictly through whole food might be a little bit tougher or more expensive or inconvenient for a lot of people because a lot of times supplements can help with convenience too. Yes, you can get you know a lot of EPA and DHA omega-3 fatty acids from wild-caught salmon or other types of fish, but you may not want to consume that high of a calorie source protein. You may not be able to afford it. And so for me, it's like if I can incorporate those things into my diet, you know, as often as I can, but daily make sure I'm meeting my needs through supplementation, that's what I'm going to do. As far as being rancid or containing, you know, PCBs or other pollutants that might be found in the water, that's easily mitigated by buying a fish oil that's sourced from let's say an Icelandic source or a Alaskan source, somewhere where we know that the heavy metal content is low. And again, this those things are supposed to be tested for as well. And you should be at certified non-detectable levels where it's so low that you'd have to use more in-depth measurement to even capture it. That standard testing won't even find that level of heavy metal. And you can, by getting the right sources or the right brands, make sure that that's the case in your fish oil. What would you say is your fourth and your fifth? Fourth, for me, very interesting as well, but applicable to men and women and for all ages would be phosphatidic acid. This is a supplement that, that we've kind of become known for, the ingredient anyway of using phosphatidic acid, PA for short. That's an ingredient that comes from either egg or from lecithin. And that can be from sunflower lecithin or soy lecithin. And it helps to turn up protein synthesis levels in our body. Now, that can have one of two impacts. If you're a younger guy like us, maybe strength training and trying to build muscle and strength, it can help you do so faster at, at a very significant level, more so than leucine or BCAAs in combination or whey protein. It can stimulate a lot of protein synthesis, help us turn over more protein into muscle and get stronger. And there's human published double-blind placebo-controlled data for that. But let's say you're a little bit older, a little bit less active, it can actually help reduce sarcopenia, which is age-related muscle loss and a decrease in amino acid sensitivity. So our body's ability to absorb protein and amino acids goes down over time. That's why people who are a little bit older will find that, man, I just can't keep muscle like I used to. Phosphatidic acid can help with that. And I don't say muscle as in like trying to stay buff, but like staying active, staying strong, staying independent. These are things that are important and it can help with those. Definitely. And then my last one, it's a tough one to get this last spot for me. I would say it would probably be right now, I think it's going to be, and this is going to be a tough one too, it would be an electrolyte supplement. Mm. Yeah. And that, and the reason that I choose that, toss up for me right now with that and turmeric. I, I almost want to talk about both, but why an electrolyte supplement first? The focus in the last 10 years, something I think has been a great success is getting people to drink more water. We're all drinking more water these days. It's pretty well understood that if you want to be healthy, you need to drink a lot of water. And that what a lot is, is typically somewhere between a half a gallon and a gallon a day, a half a gallon being on the low end. Most people who consider themselves to be water drinkers are trying to get a gallon a day. Right. Now, there is a, a ramification to that where if you're consuming just plain water, you're also going to be increasing your need for electrolyte because you're going to be washing a lot of the sodium, potassium, magnesium out of your body and chloride, you'll be pushing that through with the water you'll be consuming because it will be pulled through. Now, if you don't do something about that, you can get in a state of feeling a little bit of fatigue, both mentally and physically, and you can get false hunger signals just from having inadequate electrolyte supply. Now, right alongside of water being elevated as so important for us, which it is, has been the demonizing of sodium and salt for a lot of people which came off of data, which was not valid, you know, a long time ago, eight, the data from the 80s. We've demonized sodium a little bit to where people in healthy populations don't need to be managing sodium levels as, you know, rigorously as we've seen. In fact, most people would probably benefit from incorporating a little bit of sea salt or regular table salt into their diet, especially if they're eating 
healthy, unprocessed, healthy organic food, foods. Yeah. There's nothing on it. So they they then, so it's like all these things are shifting to where our water intake's going up and our electrolyte intake's going down. So we need to make sure we're managing that. And so for a lot of people, especially if you're active and depleting even more that way, an electrolyte supplement, one that doesn't have artificial additives or sweeteners or sugar or even calories at all, but delivers a little bit of an electrolyte punch in the water that they drink throughout the day can be very effective for reducing fatigue and false hunger signals. Last one, turmeric. I'll just say it made my top six. I rounded it out. <laughs> that can reduce gut inflammation and whole body inflammation as well as like right. being like one of the best things you can do for your joints too. So you got brain health and gut health, which are very intimately linked and you have joint health all being improved by one supplement. So I'm a big fan of turmeric. I like turmeric. Yeah. I guess I had like one more question about regulatory issues. I noticed like sometimes some companies would get caught like not even living up to their label claims. I mean, there'll be like almost nothing that's shown on the label that's actually in the supplement. And you would Google it and you would see online they're being like sued by the FDA, this organization, this organization. But then you go to like your local supplement store and you still see those supplements there month after month after month like being sold. Why does it take like so long to take like fraudulent supplements off of the counter? The legal system is a mess. So a company may be involved in action by the FDA where they've either gotten a letter or they're full on in the middle of a lawsuit. But typically nothing happens until after the lawsuit is completed. And these things can be dragged out for years, Mm -hmm. for two, three years sometimes. And then I've even seen it where a lawsuit went on for two, three years and then the company won. It's never a product quality issue when that happens. It's always an issue of whether an ingredient was legal to use or not. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, that that act de Shea that regulates the supplements is kind of murky about what existed before that the agreement went into effect and what didn't. So companies basically have to prove if an ingredient, you know, wasn't on that list somehow that it was in retail or, or in, in the space before the agreement went into effect. And they might be able to find proof of that be like, Oh, it was sold in Florida in 1981 under this name. So it's allowed and they would be right. So there's a lot of that type of stuff that goes on, especially with these stimulants or hormones that really, in my opinion, shouldn't be sold that are not, you know, really that safe, but it would fall within the guidelines of what should and shouldn't happen. But in terms of quality control, if there's an issue with a product being contaminated purposefully or accidentally, usually the FDA will will force the manufacturer to initiate a recall. And that particular product should be removed from the shelves immediately. Now, there's usually no delay on that. However, you might see that the company immediately does that recall, but depending on how large they are, they issue a replacement. Mm. So they manufacture something new or different or supposedly now correct, and then send that in replacement of what they took off the shelf. So especially if they're going to be you know, doing such a huge recall, they don't want to lose all that shelf space as well. So they'll probably replace it rather than just lose out. Gotcha. Yeah. And that just goes back to what you were saying in the very beginning of the episode where you said it's all about having that paper trail of having your company that documents all the products and where they come from and going through the regulations and doing it right. So you're not getting these recalls and all these different things that happen to a supplement company if they don't go through it. They don't go the right way with it. And I'd hate to ever get in a situation where I said that you can 1000% for sure eliminate every variable of everything happening because, you know, if, if something happened, I would want it to be understood that we did everything we could to, to stop it. So, of course, it could happen, but it's really next to impossible when you do all of the things correctly. It, the less things you do to prevent it, the more likely it is it's going to happen. So we try and do everything possible to prevent it. And yeah, a lot of companies don't do anything to prevent it. They just hope for the best with everything they do. Trust that someone that they don't even know is going to make the products correctly because most companies don't make their own products, nor are they involved in their own supply chain. So they don't know where their ingredients came from. They just ordered it from some contractor that then assembles everything for for them. They're not intimately involved in any of the production parts. So they don't know. They really don't know any better. And unfortunately, that ignorance is not bliss because Mm -hmm. that allows a lot of opportunity for things to go wrong. That's where you find that companies have their products tested and they contain, you know, very limited amounts or none of what was on the label. That's why that happens. It's usually not because the company was like, 
hey, we want to make this product that is going to contain nothing that's on the label and we want to just lie about it. Usually they order what they wanted from this bulk supplier and they just get something else. Mm -hmm. You've been in the supplement industry for many years. Outside of like amino spiking, what other things have you seen that like companies try to do to kind of cut corners just to increase their profitability? I mean, the biggest problem in the supplement industry is products not meeting their label claim. Amino spiking was a strategy to get around that where they used bulk amino acids like glycine or taurine that were extremely inexpensive to buffer their protein content because they might cost about 10 to 15 percent of what the actual protein source would cost. So they would put that in there to make up five to 10 grams of what was supposed to be in the scoop. So if there was supposed to be 20 grams of protein, they might instead use 10 grams of protein and 10 grams of these bulk amino acids. That's what amino spiking is in case your listeners aren't familiar. But that problem occurs even more maliciously throughout the rest of the industry where it's like, they're supposed to be X number of milligrams or grams of an ingredient, and they just put less, just straight up, right off the top, put less. I like their honesty. Yeah, they're they just, just put, putting less. <laughs> they, yeah, it's not. Even, it, but but the label reflects. Uh, yeah, what, what, yeah what I mean. they just put less. <laughs> they're like, hey, no one's gonna know. Just put less. Like, just shave that down. And let's just say it was a product, like let's just say a turmeric product, where that's the only ingredient in the product by lowering the amount of turmeric you put in by just 10%, you can probably lower the overall product cost by 8%, you know, like, so you can give yourself a discount on manufacturing. That's what companies are doing. That's the biggest problem. That's why it's something that people should demand that companies do is independently test their products for label claim to make sure that what is claimed on the label is accurate. And there's always a range. Like if it says it's 800 milligrams, it doesn't need to be exactly 800 to be accurate. It could be anywhere from 790 to 810. Let's say there's a there's an acceptable allowance of variation and it should be some, somewhere within 3%. But companies have to hold themselves accountable by doing independent testing. You should do your own testing in-house that's required, but you should also additionally do out-of-house testing to verify and keep everyone honest. You know, And, and companies who, like I said, don't handle their own supply chain don't handle their own manufacturing, don't handle their own bottling, and then don't test their own products. What what do you really know about them? You know, you really just ordered it online, quote, basically, because you've never even been to the facility where it was made. And this is true for a lot of companies. They've never even been where their products get made. So you're literally just ordering a lot of something online, <laughs> just like someone's going to do from that company. And this happens at a large scale. So Independent testing can help prevent this, but that is the biggest problem, no matter what the category is. If it's fish oil, it's that they put less fish oil. If it's turmeric, they put less turmeric. Amino acids, they put less amino acids. Whatever it is, that's the problem, meeting label claim. How do you feel like trying to do everything like by the book and honesty, and then you have like these competitor products right near your product on the store, on like the store shelf, you know, like seeing that day in and day out and like basically totally acceptable. And it's very rare that they're probably ever going to get caught, you know? And I tell myself that the people who would do that, they don't actually care about the products or the industry. And this has held true to where they don't, they're not able to do it forever. They either move on to something else, like another opportunity that is more lucrative, or they get caught. One of those two things, or their products flat out don't deliver so their retention is low. Mm -hmm. So one of the three ways we end up acquiring their customer. So one of the best examples of this, I'll tell you openly, it doesn't really matter, is like Shreds, the company Shreds in the past. A lot of people really hated them for many reasons. Maybe I didn't think they were the best, but they created a lot of new consumers that they were unable to retain because for various different reasons, their products didn't line up to what the consumer expected. And so those consumers then grew up and became mature consumers in our industry and looked for better options. And we are that better option. Uh, many other companies might be a better option. So there's a life cycle to everything. And so these companies who cut corners and do things wrong, they don't last forever. And once consumers get their products and either learn that there's better options or have a bad experience, hopefully we can acquire that customer. Well, with that said, Sean, what, where can people find more about you? You can check me out on Instagram at Sean Torbati. 
you guys could probably put that on here for me, right? Yeah, yeah so you guys can you can follow me there and you can find out about uh, my different companies from there. But you can check out my uh, all natural plant based performance supplements. It's at True Supplements on Instagram. You can check out High Performance Nutrition on Instagram as well as the Ambrosia Collective. Those are different companies that I have that each specialize in a different area of supplementation, different category. Perfect. That's perfect. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming. And it was great to uh, have you as a guest. Thanks for having me on, guys. Awesome. Great, Sean. Thanks. If you like our content and you want to have more of it, send us an email. It'll be in the show notes. And tell us what you want to hear about. If you want the most recent updates from us and you enjoyed the show, please subscribe.